bit about what it is, but the main purpose of this talk is actually to kind of talk about the architectural possibilities and how it can actually help your business needs in order to build upon it. Um, so <clears throat> first I'll just quickly talk about what it is. Uh, I'm sure all of you are familiar with Bitcoin D, Bitcoin QT, like that. So what BTCD is, is it's a completely new, clean slate, full node implementation. It's essentially a drop-in replacement for Bitcoin D. Uh, supports everything that Bitcoin D does, um, minus mining, which is coming soon. Uh, as I mentioned, it does everything. So uh, it also provides a compatible RPC interface. So existing solutions that you have that make RPC calls into Bitcoin D will work with BTCD too. And we think that's important. Uh, so, like some examples of those would be a Git peer info, or if you add a node, sending raw transactions, decoding scripts, uh, all, all of those uh, RPC calls, if you're familiar with them. We support them, complete compatibility. Uh, one of the key points that we actually tried to do when we developed it, though, is that we put a big focus on making it modular and uh, improving it for developers. Uh, we, we want developers to actually build better tools for the end users that are based upon it. And in order for them to do that, they need solid, easily accessible tools. I think one of the issues with the current existing client is that it's a really solid piece of code and it does what it does well, but it's this ball, right? It's this one monolithic piece that if you're trying to build services on top of it, it's very difficult to do because you can't like just call out and say, hey, parse this address for me, or I need a transaction script that pays over here. You can't get at any of that. It's just this thing. So we've actually separated all of that out, and that's one of the major things that I'm going to go over. Um, go back. Uh, the other thing is, is that the license on it is ISC. If you're not familiar, it's sort of like a BSD license. It's very business friendly. You can use it in commercial code. Uh, no fees. Um, so the, talk a little bit about the company I'm with and, and what we do. We're behind it. So uh, Conformal Systems is the company that uh, I'm with. Um, we have a payment processing service you've probably heard of, CoinVoice, um, and it is actually run on top of BTCD, and it's one of the main reasons that we originally worked on it, because we found that we couldn't do some of the things we needed to do with the existing client. And um, we also wanted to improve the architecture of the entire network, because we want a robust system to build our business on top of. Uh, another thing we do is uh, CypherTight. It's a zero-knowledge uh, backup solution. And the main reason I just mentioned that is that you know, it's good for like storing your wallet and also that we have a lot of crypto experience. Uh, that's kind of where we got our start. Um, so if you can look over here, this, the, on the right-hand side, you see there's an architectural diagram. Everything inside that big blue box is actually sort of the internals of how BTCD is set up modularly internally, but I don't really want to focus on that today. What I want to kind of talk about is the other stuff that's outside of that box, because those are the pieces that if you're writing your application code that you'll want to integrate with. Um, so the first one uh, over there that I'll talk about is, is BTC chain. Um, so what this package essentially does is it has all of the core consensus chain rules. This is like, for example, a block showed up. Um, and is it uh, extending the main chain? Is it a fork? Is it an orphan? How does it get handled? So this package handles all of that kind of stuff. And so what you might want to do with it as a service provider, I'm sure you guys know that you have this bits field in the block header that shows up that talks about the difficulty. So it actually provides methods that you can say, what is the difficulty target of this block? And you can quickly and convert that into a number that you can actually do things with. Um, and also if you need to access known good checkpoints, if you want to compare your, you know, the block against these known good checkpoints, you can, can do those kind of things. Uh, the next package I'll kind of cover quickly is the EC package. And I think this is actually a, a quite a, a little bit more useful than chain in many ways, um, is that it's, it stands for elliptic curve, and it basically implements all of the cryptographic primitives that comprise Bitcoin, you know, the signatures, the public keys, the ability to create them, the ability to verify them and uh, serialize them, you know, in transaction scripts when you're creating them, the, the actual public keys have to be serialized to create the script. So this package handles all that. In fact, if you guys are familiar with Ripple, they use this package in their node to be able to interface with Bitcoin. Uh, Another really useful one, and this is, goes right back to the example that I gave in the beginning, is that the BTC script package, this is where it lets you build these custom scripts. If you're writing an application and you want to be able to um, play around with creating a new script type that's a non-standard type, uh, you can actually, we have a script builder in there that you can just say, you know, I want to create a new script. These are the opcodes that I want to add. This is the data I want to add. And then, on top of actually creating them, 
you can create a script engine and say, is this valid? Is it going to, when I go to put this into the blockchain and I ha end up with transactions on both sides, are they going to, is it going to execute and give me a proper answer? And so that allows you to build services that actually create new scripts. And I'll talk about a little bit why that matters for things like colored coin and think, uh, later. Uh, another really useful package is the BTC util package. And what this one does is, uh, I'm sure all of you are well familiar with the fact that when you want to send bitcoins to somebody, you've got an address, right? And it starts with one for the main network. And, and everybody who accepts these things has to parse them. If you want to, you know, do anything, any kind of service that deals with these, you have to know how to deal with base 58, and it's modified. It's not even standard base 58 using bitcoin. And you also have to deal with addresses, and there's multiple types of addresses. These things you can pay to pub keys, pub key hashes, script hashes, and, and uh, so basically what this package does is it, it makes that really easy to deal with. You're like, here's a string, give me back an address from it, and then you can take that address and pass it into the script package and say, now give me a script that pays to this address. So unlike, you know, what I was talking about with the core, where you really have to kind of roll all this stuff yourself, which as you guys have probably more than well aware, has led to people getting it wrong, led to theft and all kinds of issues. The, the idea here is that these core packages are well tested, they work properly, you can just build your services on top. Uh, and finally, as far as packages are concerned, uh, is the BTC wire package. Um, what this one essentially does, it's the entire wire protocol. So whenever two uh, nodes or peers on the network come up and they want to talk to each other, they have to talk with the Bitcoin protocol. And that's what this package implements. And so by making this a separate package, what it will enable you to do is, uh, are, is anybody in here familiar with the uh, getadder.bitnodes.io project? Um, if not, I'll explain real quick. It's a website that essentially you go out there and it shows you all of the currently active reachable nodes on the network, where they're at physically, you know, geolocation, as well as what clients they're running. And so the, the BTC wire package, <clears throat> excuse me, it really supports those type of analytics and those capabilities because what you can do is you can create a quick light client that says, hey, connect to a Bitcoin node out there, send the diversion message, and grab the addresses. That's it, right? You know, it's, it's very, very easy to work with. And that's kind of the idea. So <clears throat> what I want to talk a little bit more, those are sort of the packages. And those are like extremely helpful if you're writing your application in Go. So, but on top of that, we also have separated the, the chain and the wallet. Uh, you know, I'm, I think that if, if you guys are familiar with how it, it works in here is that the, the current QT client, you know, it actually handles everything and like I said, it's this one monolithic piece. So, you know, y y what you have there is that your chain and the actual network communication, the chain rules and everything, and the wallet, it's all inseparable. And so what that leads to is it leads to things that if you want to have multiple wallets, if I have a wallet on my laptop and then I have a wallet over on my uh, desktop system at home, you need to have the blockchain twice. You need to have it everywhere where you have the wallet. And obviously that's huge, right? You know, six, I think it's like 19 gigabyte right now. So um, by separating that out, you can have one chain and then, you know, multiple wallets that communicate with it. And so, and I have a few bullet points there too. Another big thing that it actually, uh, one of the benefits is, is that if you don't have to, well, one of the reasons that a lot of people run web wallets and things is that they don't want to have to deal with having a beefy enough machine to, you know, download the entire blockchain, to be able to keep up with all the crypto and everything that's associated with it. So, um, you know, what this will let you do is that you can kind of farm out the fact, sort of think of SPV in a way, but a little bit different. But it's sort of the idea is that, you know, the, the one machine is handling all of that hefty, heavy lifting, and then you can have this low, you know, old, per, old hardware, like low, you know, I'm sorry, uh, potential to repurpose old hardware is the way that I put it, but you can reuse older hardware that doesn't have anywhere near the power that is required for a real full node. Um, so one of the examples I, I wanted to give that, you know, you can build on top of uh, how you can use this architecture to your benefit is that you can actually run, and I was mentioning before about the separation, is you can run BTCD on your home system and then use an open VPN or a Tor hidden service, you can expose that out. And so by doing that, then you can run, we have a separate thing called BTC wallet and GUI. And by these two things is you can run the wallet and the GUI on your laptop um, for example, on my laptop here, 
you can run it, and then you're actually connecting back home through the VPN or through Tor to the system with the chain. I don't know about you guys, but my laptop doesn't even have a hard drive big enough to hold the blockchain, so there is absolutely no way I could do it on there without having some way to, you know, separate that out. Uh, and another big benefit, of course, is that um, if you guys have used QT at all, you know that you generally when you turn or when you you know, close QT and then you bring it back up, it has to sync back up, right? You know, if you've had it off for three weeks, it's like, please wait while we sync to the chain and, you know, and you're, you're trying to catch up. Well, if you're traveling, you're, you know, because it's always running on your home system, it's sitting there staying synced and then you open up your, your laptop, you go through your suspend resume when you're traveling and you just connect up and it's already synced. You're, you know, there's no extra time involved there. Um, another big feature that I think that would, uh, you know, be beneficial for providers that are giving services to set up is that right now this is not really a big talked about thing, but uh, it goes back to that get address uh, bit nodes project. I can go out there and I can find IP addresses of everybody running that has it, that's listening, of everybody that's running a Bitcoin D node. Now, chances are they probably have coins there too because they're running Bitcoin QT and they're, they have a wallet. So it's a pretty good bet that that IP address has some coins I might want to try to steal. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, you may be wrong, but it's a good bet. So one of the nice things that you could do, for example, with the separation is you can set up BTCD on a, an internet accessible machine that has multiple NICs in it. And then you can set up a, a VLAN internal and then you can put wallet on a completely separate machine. Uh, you can encrypt the partition, and you don't generally want to encrypt the partition with the blockchain on it. It's public data, so I mean, you know, there's no reason to encrypt it and spend all the extra time that that takes. So, you know, you can encrypt this separate machine. It's completely not accessible from the internet. So, even if somebody were to manage to hack into that public IP address, the the BTCD node, they can't get to your coins. They're not there. They're off somewhere else. And. Uh, so, you know, we think that's a, a really good way for things, for example, you know, you take the whole exchanges getting hacked and everything like that. You know, so what if your web server gets compromised, the thing that's running BTCD is, you know, the coins aren't there. So, you know, you can't steal them. Uh, another big thing that, uh, that this was, this is kind of more getting into building apps on top of BTCD. Um, and so we actually provide a web sockets for real time notifications of things such as blocks being connected, blocks being disconnected, uh, transactions as they show up to the network. And so what these will kind of allow you to do, uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with things like uh, color coin. Um, so you can build advanced wallets, for example, that do things like uh, extra, so essentially what color coin lets you do is it lets you keep different uh, balances. So you might want to in the same wallet. So you might have some balances that, that are paid by, to one of your companies and some other balance that are paid to another or something along those lines. So you could actually, without having to re-implement everything, you, can, you could build an advanced wallet on top of it that allows these type of, of functionalities and another one is, would be dark wallets. A dark wallet would be one where the actual provider doesn't know anything about it, only the wallet knows about it. And so you could use this, this querying mechanism to build these types of wallets instead of using BTC wallet, for example, uh, customers or con uh, businesses can build their own wallets with unique capabilities. Uh, another big feature would be analytics. Uh, you know, if you want to, uh, obviously, the, one of the things that um, you guys have probably all seen is like blockchain. And so blockchain has essentially sort of done this in a way where they keep their own database. So, but they had to re-implement a whole lot of code to be able to do that. And so, you know, with this, all the chain, the hard stuff that's, that you probably don't want to redo because you can get, easily get it wrong. And if you get it wrong, you have chain forks and, and things that you want to avoid. Uh, you know, by, by building on top of that, you can build any kind of analytics platform by building up your own database. Like, for example, I was mentioning that you can get a notification when every new transaction shows up to the network. So you can then take that transaction, stuff it into your own database, whether it's Postgres or whatever you want to use, and then you can build any application you want, make that data queryable, you know, munch it, anything you want to do with it from an analytics perspective. We think that's quite powerful. Um, so one of the things I want to show here now, have Shane hit Alt-Tab for me. Um, so, thank you. Uh, so what I have here is, this is something that I wrote, it's a little bit ugly, I apologize for that, but I just put it together quickly for this uh, presentation is, this is just a browser, Firefox, I wrote an HTML file, it's using straight up JavaScript web sockets, and at home, over the VPN, I actually have a BTCD node running. And so I'm going to connect to it, right here, hit connect, and so I just connected to that BTCD node. 
And so what I'm going to tell it to do now is that I want to know everything that happened. There we go. So if we look right here, I just authenticated. But this address right there, I told it, tell me everything that happened to that Bitcoin address in between blocks 40,000 and 50,000. And so it came back and it said that at block 20, what is that? Uh, sorry, 40,921 right here. Or 49,817, sorry. So at that block right there, it actually... shows up to the network so right now it's sitting here listening and of course it's gonna you know there are no transactions but there we go a Bitcoin transaction just showed up in the memory pool and there's another one so there are the live transactions now obviously this machine doesn't have the chain it's that fast I didn't have to sync up anything I, this is all because it's all remote so I can find out all this information and there's quite a bit more too in the WebSocket API, but you can also do a lot of legacy commands, all those ones that I was mentioning earlier, like sending raw transactions, decoding scripts and everything, and you can do it right through the same interface. Can you alt tab back over for me, Shane? <coughs> okay, so the last thing I kind of wanted to talk about is that, you know, you, you talked about all these architectural changes and you're like, well, you know, are they a good idea? What about security? Or, you know, um, why isn't the reference implementation doing it? Well, they are. They actually have been, they have noticed that, uh, you know, a lot of these architectural decisions make sense. And we're actually starting to drive these changes back into the reference implementation. So Bitcoin D is improving as a result of some of these efforts, which is fantastic for the ecosystem. And we are really excited about that because it helps everybody, right? As the entire ecosystem gets stronger, it helps everybody. Um, some examples of that that I, that I was gonna talk about is that uh, when you're talking about sending RPC calls and things uh, to the client, currently in the Bitcoin D, it's actually the daemon itself that does that. So it acts as the server and the client. So what we did is we're like, well, you know, you may not want to be running those on the same machine, for example. So we separated it out into a separate utility, thank you, called BTC Cuddle. And so now in the 090 release of Bitcoin Core, as they've rebranded it now, they're coming out with Bitcoin CLI, which is the exact same thing. Uh, another example is the, uh, you know, they're, they're, that you may have noticed is that they're providing a disable wallet option to be able to turn that wallet off at that same IP that I was talking about. That, you know, that, but they don't have a separate wallet. But, you know, they're kind of working toward that. So the point is, is that I think that, uh, you know, it shows that even the core developers agree with these architectural decisions uh, by proxy that they make sense because they're starting to also make these changes as well. And so uh, one other thing that uh, we did is that we're really big on testing. Uh, if you look at some of our core packages, we have 100% test coverage, like the BTC wire protocol. Um, so we wanted to enable regression testing easily. Uh, currently, in the Bitcoin D stuff, for example, if you want to do regression testing, you actually had to apply a patch to run the official tool because it does things a little bit differently. So you had to apply a patch to be able to run the regression test. And so but, uh, what we did is we added a, a reg test mode with a flag that you can do it so you can run the official regression test against it. And again, the, in the latest the release of Bitcoin D, they're going to have a... Uh, uh, minus reg test. So just some examples of some of the ways that uh, th these uh, ideas are, are clearly, uh, you know, important and, and are being accepted back into the community. And, you know, we, we've already implemented and had them running for months, by the way. So it's not the, that we're just giving the ideas. We've actually written the code. And as you saw, it works <laughs> and it's solid. Um, so last slide then is uh, just, you know, where, um, where to get it. Everything is, as I mentioned, ISC licensed. So it's completely open source and it's freely available. And it's all on GitHub. So github.com slash conformal and then slash the project name. And so there's the BTCD, BTC GUI, and BTC wallet. And then all the other packages that I mentioned earlier are also there. So if you want to be able to integrate with them. And if you're looking for more information, we also have a, a lot of blog posts about these packages and how to use them at uh, blog.conformal.com. And uh, you know, the other thing is, is that you know, if you're looking to build services, uh, we'd love to uh, have some early adopters where, you know, we, we really want to improve the Bitcoin community as a whole. We want to enable businesses to build better services for customers. And so, you know, we're very willing to help out if you have questions or, or need uh, advice and, you know, how, how, you, how to build on top of that. You can pop by our IRC channel and, uh, you know, we're happy to help. 
And that might have been a little bit early, but uh, I think we're at the questions time. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, that was pretty close. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any questions? All right. Do you have any questions? Yep, I think Brian. Oh, yeah, right over here. Okay. Um, the I, I just saw a demonstration of the um, finding a transaction, the address. Yes. That's something that BTC, the Satoshi client, doesn't do. That is correct. How do you keep a database to so, go the other direction? What, we or, don't. Or to, um, to go that direction because you need to go from. It, it's actually scanning right now. So okay. you know, if you're if you're constantly doing it, uh, it would make more sense to make a database. That's true, and uh, we've actually considered and probably will add a flag to allow you to keep the database. It's not on by default because the fact that the database to maintain the entire transaction ledger is probably somewhere in the neighborhood of another five gig, and so we didn't want to have that on for everybody by default. But you know, if you're a service and you want to use that capability, clearly your node that you control, you can turn on. Uh, you know, if we provide the flag, and we would definitely be willing to do that, then you could turn on a database that would save uh, all that information and make those queries that much faster. But you could see it was already pretty quick. <laughs> but yeah, that that was very neat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is this the only other full node implementation? As far as I know, it's the only one that does everything. Um, I know that there's like a bits of proof, which is sort of a Java uh, full node implementation. I, I don't believe you can mine or anything off of it. I don't know all the, the details, but I, I, I'm pretty sure this is actually the only other one that is basically a drop in replacement that has complete RPC compatibility and everything. Is anyone using it for mining that you know of? Uh, no, because the mining support is only 95%. I was saying. I, at the beginning of the talk, I mentioned that I'm going to put it out. And the goal is that, yeah, we do want uh, people to use it for mining because right now everybody who mines uses the one client. It's better for the ecosystem to have multiple clients. Okay. Is that it? Any other questions? All right. That's good. Oh. Now one more. Something else. So you say you have a company based around this. What is your business model if you're giving the software away? Uh, Coinvoice. It's a payment processor. So uh, basically, it's it's like BitPay in a way, but it's the opposite. Uh, so we'll actually accept U.S. dollars. So you invoice your customer. They pay U.S. dollars. And then we convert that to Bitcoin and then send it to whatever addresses you, you know, tell us to send it to. And then we have a percentage of that that we take. And so that's where we make our money. But we based all of our, that, that whole infrastructure is based off of this back-end software. But you go both directions. We do go both directions. That's yeah. correct. Not you personally. Coin, no, the coin voice. voice. Right. Yes. Yeah, correct. Gotcha. It's a little joke. Yeah, we'll do the, the Bitcoin as well to, to U.S. dollars. Um, and so we also have some merchant services that, uh, that build on top of that. But like I said, the, the, the key goal here to all of this is really enabling more services uh, to build on top of Bitcoin because we need to get more people using it and, and it needs to be friendlier. And, and the only way that's going to happen is if we have more people building instead of, you know, redoing. And that's kind of the problem right now. One of the first things that we noticed when we were trying to write this is that there was nothing that we could actually use from the stuff that's out there. It's all just tightly integrated and it's like if you want to build something that, you know, pays transactions, roll your own. Right? And so we don't, we don't want that anymore. We actually want people to not focus on that. Focus on the future. Let's make, let's build stuff together. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it.